Hello, Emma Smith here in Oxford. I think this is the fourth play in your course that I've had the pleasure of introducing. We're at Time and of Athens now. Well done for uh, getting through uh, the canon uh, so uh, effectively and consistently. And well done for getting to this strange, uh, troubling, satirical, com slightly comfortless play. I find it a really fascinating play. And I think it's fascinating at least because for many critics, it doesn't really fit with the great tragedies, and there's been a huge amount of philosophical and theatrical work and psychological work done on those plays. Uh, Timon doesn't really fit with that, and so it's a bit of an outlier. And it's also a play, if you're a, if you're a theatre-goer, or in happier times at least a theatre-goer, it's also a play which hasn't really had... I'm sorry, that's my puppy's tail just coming into the, into, in, into the view. Yes, very helpful, thank you. It's also a play which hasn't really had... Uh, it's um, defining modern theatrical production. Um, there's one that you might want to look up, uh, directed by Nicholas Heitner with Simon Russell Beale at the National Theatre, which was widely associated with the financial crash uh, of, of 2007 uh, and had some interesting things to say about late capitalism, drawing on the play's own inscription probably of early capitalism. In a way, uh, the play dramatises the shift from uh, a, a set of economic relationships which are based on sort of hospitality and reciprocity uh, to ones which are based on 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 capital uh, and are alienated I think because of that uh, it's not for nothing that this was Karl Marx's favorite Shakespeare play the one that he cites uh, most frequently and the one uh, in which he discusses what gold uh, means it, it's it's its meanings uh, and it's it, it, it's um, it's collapse, in fact, uh, in the second half of the play. That relationship with money, which I think is crucial, um, is uh, the sort of flip side of something that's missing in Timon, uh, but which is very common in other tragedies. And that's that Timon has no family. He has no affective bonds. Uh, he has a household, a steward, um, uh, table companions... Uh, hangers-on, people who uh, need his money, want his patronage, um, but no wife, no no family, no emotional connections. Uh, there are no women in this play who are not uh, characterised as, as whores. Uh, it, it's a play which is very low on human connectedness and familial uh, connectedness, and that too separates it out from uh, the other tragedies. Most scholars, uh, as you'll have read, think of Timon as a collaboration, perhaps the only synchronous collaboration between Shakespeare and uh, his fellow playwright Thomas Middleton. And that may explain some of its um, particular take uh, on uh, economics. Middleton is a very um, economically driven uh, playwright. For some of those critics, um, Collaboration has been an explanation for a kind of broken structure uh, in the play. I don't see it like that at all. It's definitely a play of two halves, but that seems to me an important part of the way it explores uh, its central theme of, of fortune. Um, lots of things in the second half of the play echo or rework or satirically reinterpret things that we've seen in the first. And lots of things are... Um, are doubled. Uh, the banquet is an obvious uh, example, an obvious dramaturgical uh, example. Uh, but the role of uh, the role of money, the role of the city versus the forest, uh, the role of the outsiders, and and the, 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 the and the role of Apamantus, uh, the, these are echoes um, across the two halves of the play, which draw out, sketch out really clearly, emblematically, allegorically, almost or. or um, uh, in a kind of morality play, the rise and fall of Timon from the philanthropic man to the misanthropic man, uh, from a man um, giving out money to uh, a man who's refused money in return and when he finds it, uh, realises he has no use for it. And a man who um, dies uh, off stage, delivers his own epitaph uh, sort of in, in writing, um, belatedly. Uh, he's denied that death speech that's so characteristic of tragic 
uh, heroes and so characteristic of how we've understood tragedy as a genre. To have the death of the named central character off stage seems really uh, to divert us away from one of the narrative pleasures of the tragic arc. So Timon is, is, is both a, a sort of a late tragedy, a, a sort of post-tragic tragedy where narrative and psychology are really paired back to reveal something structural uh, about, about the sort of social condition of being human, the, the social and cultural and economic condition of being human. Uh, and in other ways, it's a kind of, it's an earlier, uh, an earlier form, perhaps the sort of everyman story. Um, it's quite striking how many characters in the play are named for their function rather than uh, for, for, a, for their psychology, for a kind of proper name. So I think, there, I think it's a mystery. I think it's an enigma, actually. And I think how you... Uh, I think finding an enigma in Shakespeare studies is actually a really wonderful gift, isn't it? Because one of the things you may be feeling is surely everything has been said, everything has been gone over in such an amount of detail. I think Timon is a less trodden, uh, a less trodden path and there's space uh, for you with the knowledge and the experience you've been building up about Shakespeare uh, to really um, unpack it and explore it uh, and make it make it make sense for our own times.